It's good to see all, all of you tonight. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Chronicles 25. And we'll go different places, but if you just stay here, that'll be a good place to be. Tonight, with the time I have, I want to talk to you about King Amaziah. And probably most of us in this room have no idea who King Amaziah is. <laughs> and that is okay. Uh, sometimes we get into the divided kingdom and we look at all those J names and all those A names and we don't know where they go or anything like that. Amaziah is usually somebody we skip in our Bible classes when we don't have the time because there isn't really much said about him. We only have this one chapter and we have one chapter in Kings. But there's something very interesting said about Amaziah in verse 2 of this chapter. And at least as far as my understanding is concerned, this is the only time a king is described in this manner. And it, it was not exactly what you would think it would be. And so he stands out, and that's why I want to spend some time talking about him tonight in a lesson we can learn from him. Look at verse 1 of chapter 25. I'll just read to verse 2. Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a loyal heart. It's interesting, you've got a man, he becomes king when he's 25, and the, the writer introduces him as, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And you're expecting him to say, like his father David, like what said most of the good kings in Judah. But that's not what the writer says. The writer says, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, but without a loyal heart. And, and it's interesting that you're going to have a man here that's going to do what's right, but with the wrong intentions behind it. And so I'd like to spend some time talking about him tonight. All I want to do is set up the setting for Amaziah, and then we're going to look at the life of Amaziah very quickly. And I just have two questions to leave us with. And after those two questions, the lesson will be yours. The first thing I need to do is let me set up the world that Amaziah lives in. Amaziah is a king in the divided kingdom. He's a king of the southern kingdom, Judah. And when Amaziah comes to power, two very powerful men have just died. The first one being Elisha, and you probably know who he is, Elisha the prophet in Israel. He has recently died, but so has Jehoiada, the high priest of Judah. And maybe not all of us exactly remember very quickly who Jehoiada is, but Jehoiada is a very important character in these past couple of chapters. If you don't remember his name, I think you'll remember the story of why Jehoiada is famous. Jehoiada is famous in our minds, or very courageous in our minds, because of the Queen Athaliah, who was Queen of Judah, Amaziah's really be three generations up from him. Athaliah is a relative of Ahab and Jezebel, and she has managed to become Queen of Judah when her son dies. When she becomes Queen of Judah, she tries to exterminate all of David's heirs. And many of us would remember that story. And as she's trying to exterminate all of David's heirs, so there would no longer be a lineage of David, meaning Jesus' line would have been cut off. Jehoiada and his aunt end up saving Joash. And he's seven years old, and they end up saving him from Athaliah. And Joash's aunt hides him in the house of the Lord with Jehoiada. Jehoiada then, as the high priest, raises an army. And with his army, they go and kill Athaliah, and they make Joash the new king of Judah. And that's why Jehoiada is so important to this story here. Even though he's the high priest, he's really ruling the country at this time, and he's doing a really good job of it too. He brings a lot of people to the Lord. He ends up removing a lot of the idols in the land, and there's a restoration happening in Judah. Well, lo and behold, Jehoiada dies, and he dies at the age of 130. The man was given a very long life for the Lord, worked very long for the Lord, but then he dies. And as the king writer says, Joash was faithful as long as Jehoiada was there to guide him. Because it seems that within a short time frame of Jehoiada's death, Joash goes and he tries to go worship some idols. And as Joash is trying to enter idolatry in the land of Judah, God sends several prophets and he even sends this prophet, Zechariah, not our Zechariah, a different Zechariah, who's the son of Jehoiada to go to rebuke Joash. But Joash, in his madness, murders Zechariah. 
And when that happens, God said, that's it. Joash, you know, we're, we're done with this. If we continue to read the story of Joash, something interesting happens, but it's very terrible at the same time. Some of Joash's servants become so angry and enraged that Joash would kill a prophet, especially a prophet that is Jehoiada's son. They set up a conspiracy together to murder Joash, and they're successful. They murder Joash. Now, don't get me wrong here. Murdering more people never solves a murder problem, right? Oh, oh, we've murdered someone. What's the solution? Let's go murder someone too. That's not a good solution. But what I will say about this is it will give you the tone of how people feel about God in the days of Amaziah. Do people respect God in the days of Amaziah? They do. And when, even when a king goes and murders a prophet, they go and get vengeance against that king for murdering the prophet. And again, I don't think that was the right thing to do. But you can see that these people are at least loyal to the Lord. At least the majority is loyal to the Lord. And I think that's very much because of Jehoiada and Elisha's influence. But now we're in a world where Joash is dead, Elisha is dead as well, and Amaziah becomes king of Judah at 25. So this man is raised in a very good environment. The action and the challenges, they've already been accomplished. They've been done years ago. Ahab and Jezebel's rule is over. You know, Elisha and Elijah were victorious. Uh, Athaliah is gone. All the bad people in the story are dead. So it seems like we're set up for a very good situation for King Amaziah, and that's how we enter the story. Now let's read these first 16 verses and see how Amaziah's story goes. Start again in verse 1 with me. Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehoiadin of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a loyal heart. Now it happened as soon as the kingdom was established for him that he executed his servants who murdered his father, the king. However, he did not execute their children, but did as written in the law of the book of Moses, where the Lord commanded saying, fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall the children be put to death for their fathers, but a person shall die for his own sin. Moreover, Amaziah gathered Judah together and set them over captains of thousands and captains of hundreds, according to their father's houses, throughout all Judah and Benjamin. And he numbered them from 20 years old and above and found them to be 300,000 300, choice men able to go to war who could handle a spear and a shield. He also hired 100,000 mighty men of valor from Israel for 100 talents of silver. But a man of God came to him saying, O king, Do not let the army of Israel go with you, for the Lord is not with Israel, not with any of the children of Ephraim. But if you go, be gone, be strong in battle. Even so, God shall make you fall before the enemy, for God has power to help and to overthrow. Then Amaziah said to the man of God, but what shall we do about the hundreds of talents which I have given to the troops of Israel? And the man of God answered, the Lord is able to give you so much more than this. So Amaziah discharged the troops that had come from Ephraim to go back home. Therefore, their anger was greatly aroused against Judah, and they returned home in great anger. Then Amaziah strengthened himself, and leading his people, he went to the Valley of Salt and killed 10,000 of the people of Seir. Also, the children of Judah took captive 10,000 alive and brought them to the top of the rock and cast them down from the top of the rock, so they were all dashed into pieces. But as for the soldiers of the army which Amaziah had discharged... So they would not go with him to battle. They raided the cities of Judah and Samaria to Beth Hedron, killed 3,000 in them and took much spoil. Now it was so after Amaziah came from the slaughter of the Edomites that he brought the gods of the people of Seir, set them up to be his gods and bowed down before them and burned incense to them. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Amaziah and he sent him a prophet who said to him, who have you sought the gods of the people? which could not rescue their own people from your hand. So it was when he talked with him that the king said to him, have we made you the king's counselor? Cease, why should you be killed? Then the prophet ceased and said, I know that God has determined to destroy you because you have done this and have not heeded my advice. And that's where we're gonna pause right there. And thank you for letting me do that longer reading. Let me put some five points up here of what we just read. 
The, the first thing is that we see is that Amaziah did obey God, especially when it came to executing those servants who had murdered his father. Now, he says, and he's very specific, he says, but he did not kill the children of the servants because the Lord had commanded that when we dish out punishments, we cannot punish whole families for the sake of individuals. And he says, no, we punish individuals for their own individual sins they've done. And we might look at a passage like that and go, well, of course, like, we're not going to throw somebody's kid in jail because something their dad did. But you got to realize in that world, that wasn't the case. It was very popular for especially Gentile kings that you would punish families for what one individual in that family had done. Think about the story of Daniel's in the lion's den. When Daniel is thrown in the lion's den and God delivers him, King Darius is very angry about these men that had made that happen. So what does he do? He goes and gets those men and he gets their entire families and he throws them in the lion's den. That was a very popular practice. But according to the law of Moses, God said, we don't do that here. And Amaziah, even with the opportunity, he obeyed God and he submitted to what was in the law of Moses. The second thing we see, Amaziah has to go to war against Edom and he numbers the people of Judah, but he also decides to hire 100,000 Israelite mercenaries. And those people from Israel were gonna come down and they were gonna help Judah defeat Edom. But then a prophet comes and a prophet tells him, look, if you take Israel with you, God's not going to be with you. You're going to fall. You need to send those Israelites home. And look what Amaziah does. He listens to the prophet, you know, and he sends the people home. Now, Amaziah does say, but what about all the money I spent on them? And the prophet says, God can give you a lot more than like a couple of hundred talents of silver. And Amaziah accepts that. He's like, okay, that's fine. We'll go. And Amaziah goes and he has this great victory against the Edomites doing what God had told him to do. Well, the Israelite hired army raids Judah while Amaziah was gone. And they end up killing 3,000 people in their raid as Amaziah is fighting the Edomites. Amaziah returns home. Seemingly, he sees what the Israelites have done. And then all of a sudden, we get this line in verse 14. Amaziah returns home. He leaves the Lord and he adopts the gods of the Edom. What in the world? Did y'all know the story was going to go that route? I know some of us are like, yeah, Andrew, I read it. No, I mean, like, if we were just watching it, you know, we didn't know the end. Could you have expected the the story to go that route? All of a sudden, we're worshiping the gods of Edom. And even the prophet brings that up. The prophet that God sends, he says, are you really worshiping the gods of Edom? The people whom the Lord Jehovah has just slaughtered? They didn't protect them. Why do they think they're going to protect you? And Amaziah just sends the prophet away and says, I didn't ask you. I need you to leave. And the prophet says, well, then the Lord's going to destroy you. A very interesting turn of events. Well, let's answer those two questions now. Why did Amaziah all of a sudden at the end of this story become an idolater? You know, we've got a man who's doing right. And from every account that we can see, at least in human eyes, he was doing right in serving the Lord. And he even trusted the Lord enough to send all those Israelites home. How did all of a sudden we're worshiping the idols of Edom? Well, before we answer that, let's make some points. God knows the answer to this question. And God knew why Amaziah became an idolater even before we got to the point that he was an idolater. And that was because of what we read in verse two, that even though Amaziah did what was right, did he have a loyal heart to the God? No, he didn't. There was no interest in here for actually serving God it seems like he was doing right just because that's what's always been done. If you remember in Samuel, Samuel goes to the house of Jesse to go choose the next king of Israel. And if you remember who Samuel chooses first, he first chooses the oldest and the tallest son of Jesse. And he says, well, certainly this is going to be king. And God's like, nah, not him. (laughs) So, So Samuel goes like to the next handsome guy. He's like, well, certainly this one. This one's going to become king of Israel. And finally, at some point, this is what the Lord says to Samuel in verse 7. He says, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For a man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We're working here with a divine being that can see your intentions and see your motivations for the decisions you make. So that's the type of God we serve. He's a God that knows the heart. 
And for some of us, we're very thankful in moments. And for others of us in different moments, we're very scared because that's the case. You see, someone here can serve God for a very long time and come to church like they're supposed to and do what they're supposed to do and do everything that was right. But really inside that heart, there's no loyalty to God. And you can fool every single one of us, can't you? You probably can fool us for a really long time. But have you ever fooled the Lord in the first place? There's no fooling him. And when we stand before him in the last day, there's going to be no fooling him then too. God knows at the beginning where this is headed. It's not a surprise to him. Not only does God know why Amaziah became an idolater, David would have known as well. It's interesting that the Chronicles writer has this word loyal heart. It seems to be that he's hearkening back to the very beginning of the book when David said this to Sol- uh, Solomon. David says this to Solomon in verse 9 of First Chronicles 28. As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches hearts and understands the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. It's interesting when you read this, you feel like it really belongs in like the Sermon on the Mount. But it's not something that Jesus said. It's something that the Holy Spirit said through David all the way back when to Solomon. He's just given Solomon the most perfect advice, which really should be handed down to us as well. You know, if you're going to be my son, Solomon, know that God is your father. And he says, and serve him. So know God as your father and serve him. But is that all David says? Serve God, Solomon. That's all you need to know. That's not what he says. He says, serve God with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. So it's not just the thought of serving God because it's the right thing to do. It's not the thought of serving God because that's what everybody else is doing. The concept here is serve God and be a willing participant of serving God that you want to serve God in your heart of hearts down deep. At the end of the day, you've made the decision that you're going to be loyal to God. And that's why you serve God. Why would David leave Solomon with this advice? Or really with this command? Because Solomon's success is dictated on whether he is actually a willing participant of God's plans for him. Solomon has all these things handed to him. He has the wealth handed to him. He has the wisdom handed to him. David sets him up in this big way, but this is only going to work in Solomon's favor if he has a willing heart to the Lord. And as we get to the end of Solomon's story, he pulls an Amaziah. He becomes an idolater. Why? Because in that moment, he had left, lost that loyal heart to the Lord. Then David gives the encouragement here. You know, if you really want to seek the Lord and you really want to have a loyal heart to the Lord, will you have one? Yes, you will. If you really want to seek God, you will find him. But if you forsake God and turn your back to him, well, then in turn, he'll cast you off forever. This is reminding us that God's a person. You know, he has feelings. He has emotions. There's a relationship that must be built. And you should expect how you treat him. If you treat him well, he'll treat you well. If you forsake him, we'll be expect to be forsaken as well. So David knows why Amaziah becomes an idolater. And really by now, we all can answer this question as well. Why did Amaziah become an idolater? Well, unless a Christian, and I'm going to bring it forward, unless a Christian is willing to be loyal to the Lord, they are going to start worshiping idols eventually. Right? And I think all of us here, at least have been around the block for a little bit, we would all agree with this concept. Unless a Christian is really willing to be a participant in this, then they are eventually going to become, start worshiping idols eventually. You can't fake this for very long. You can fake this for a while, but eventually there's going to come a moment where you can't fake it anymore and you're going to have idols in your house. And of course, I'm not talking about the idols of Edom that were built out of like these little statues. You know, there's eventually going to be something that's going to come across in the world that you're going to find yourself more loyal to than to the Lord, and you're going to choose that thing over the Lord. You'll meet Christians that have fallen away. You go and try to talk to them. All they want to do is talk about their careers. All they want to talk about is their retirement plans. 
All they can talk about is what their kids did this weekend. All they can talk about is what vacation they went on. What's the issue? They can't even talk about God. Well, it's because they become idolaters. They worship these other things more than they ever would worship God. And really, they should have expected to end up here because that's what it proved. They did what was right for a while but they never had a very willing, loyal heart to the Lord. And now it has shown, right? It also does not matter what type of environment they're raised in. And I think Amaziah is definitely proof of this. You know, we can get a person and we can raise them in a gated community and we can make sure that only their neighbors are Elisha's and Jehoiada's and Elijah's. And we can make sure that they go visit Abraham on the weekends. But unless they're a willing participant to be bound to Jesus, it's not going to work out. There has to be a decision made for every individual as whether they're going to be loyal to God or not. And at the end of the day, the environment can give you advantages. The environment so that we have can give us disadvantages. Sometimes we gain advantages because of certain disadvantages we've had. But at the end of the day, unless you have a loyal heart to the Lord, none of it matters. Amaziah was given the greatest advantages but he wasn't a willing participant of it. And that's why he fell, right? If this wasn't the case, if it was not true that you had to have a willing mind towards the Lord or be a willing participant of the kingdom to be a Christian, a faithful Christian, if you didn't need to be willing, you know what we would do? We would line up all our young people that haven't obeyed the gospel and we would just line them up and baptize them one by one. That's what we would do, right? And my understanding is, is that there's one particular denomination that does exactly that. You know, we got people that are at least willing to show up or their parents make them come. Let's line them all up and baptize them one by one and they'll be in the kingdom. But we don't do that. Why? Because we believe that what David said here was true. You have to have a loyal heart and a willing mind. It has to be your decision. You have to want this. And if you want it, you'll find it. But if you don't want it, and we force it upon you, well, then in two or three weeks, you're going to go back into idolatry. There has to be a loyal heart here. And I think that's something that Amaziah teaches. That's why he becomes an idolater at the end of the story. Here's my second question. If God knew, then why did he still try with Amaziah? You know, we made it very clear from verse two. I have a good impression that God here saw Amaziah doing right, and he saw Amaziah obeying the Lord, but he knew that his intentions of his heart really weren't to serve God. So why didn't God just smoke him right then and there? Because God already knows, right? Like, he's not fooling the Lord. So why doesn't he just like smoke him when he tries to execute these men? Why does he even bother to send the prophet the first time to tell him, don't die and eat them, turn the Israelites away? And even when Amaziah is now worshiping the gods of Edom, why does God even bother to send a prophet to try to rebuke him and tell him to put those gods away and come back to the Lord? Why does God even bother? Well, the last question we learned something about Amaziah, this question I'm trying to make us learn something about God. This is who God is. God still tried with Amaziah because he desired to. He he wanted Amaziah in a safe state. And to bring up a sort of similar question from 2 Peter 3, the people in 2 Peter 3 ask, you know, why hasn't the Lord returned? Why hasn't he punished the evildoers? And this is how Peter answers. He says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That, that's who God is. God doesn't want to smote Amaziah. He doesn't want to give up on him. But instead, he's going to try to be long-suffering with Amaziah to give him every opportunity to repent. And God gives Amaziah several opportunities to repent. So that's why if God knew he, did, he still tried with Amaziah, he still made attempts for his soul. You know, and as well, at one time, Amaziah was willing to obey. Like we read about that in verse four. He did what was written in the law of the book of Moses, where the Lord commanded saying. And that first phrase in verse two is he did right in the eyes of the Lord. 
There was a time when Amaziah actually was obedient. And the Lord was trying to pull off of that. Let me put you in a real life scenario right now. Let's say you're, you're someone that you, you realize in your heart of hearts, you're really not interested in what we're doing here. You know, and you can keep that to yourself. You don't have to tell me unless you'd like to. If you would like to, I would be more than happy to talk to you about that. But let's just say you're someone you know you don't have a loyal heart to the Lord. Should you keep on coming to church anyhow? There's some Christians out there that'll tell you no. You shouldn't even bother if you don't want to be here. I, I tend to disagree with that. If you're someone and you know right now you don't really want to be here, but you decided to come anyhow, I think that's very admirable of you. Because we've talked about how God's still trying with Amaziah, right? He's still working on Amaziah. Well, what is Amaziah doing by still being obedient, even though he's not feeling like it? Amaziah is still trying with God. Can God work with the triers? God can work with the triers, can he? And I think that's why God is still sending Amaziah prophets, even though he doesn't have a loyal heart. Because Amaziah is making some kind of attempt. And I think attempts are good. And, and, I, and so if you're someone like that, I would encourage you, keep on trying to obey the Lord and work on those heart issues as we go. And, and thinking about that, that brings me that to my third point. If God knew, then why did he try with Amaziah? Well, let me bring up two thoughts. Should we obey even when we do not feel like we have a loyal heart? And let me add a second one before we answer that. Should we obey even when God has allowed something bad to happen to us? Because I think that might be what was the, the catalyst that caused Amaziah to adopt the Edomite gods. He returns home and he sees all those Israelites that he had sent home have raided his nation. And I imagine Amaziah was very hurt by that. You know, why would God tell me to send these people home if they were going to do this terrible thing? So he adopts the gods of the Edom. Should, should we obey? If you're someone that still obeys, even though you don't feel like you have a loyal heart, you don't feel it in here, but you still do it all anyway, can I, can I tell you something? That means that you do have a loyal heart. <laughs> do you understand that? If you don't feel like obeying God, but you do it anyway, what is that a guarantee of? You are loyal to the Lord. You're so loyal to him, you'll do it even when you don't want to. Can you get any more loyal than that? I don't think that's an Amaziah. I think that's someone a little bit more like the Lord Jesus. Can you remember an event where Jesus in here did not feel like obeying to the Lord, but he went ahead and did it anyway. Does that not take you back to the garden? When he tells the Lord three times, take this cup away from me. I don't want to go to the cross, but what does the Lord do even though he doesn't feel like doing it? He still submits and obeys the Father's will. So does Jesus have a loyal heart to the Father? Well, absolutely he does. And those moments when we don't feel like doing right, but we do it anyway, I don't think that makes us like Amaziah. I think that makes us like Jesus. And I think that's something we need to take away from Amaziah's story as a, as a contrast. Should we obey even when God has allowed something bad to happen to us? Well, what's the definition of loyalty? You know, are you loyal to your spouse when only times are good? If we knew someone that was only loyal to their spouse when times were good, would we call that person a loyal spouse? No, we would call them like a spouse out of convenience, right? That's not a loyal spouse. That's not a loyal friend. What does loyalty even really mean? Does it not mean trusting in someone even when times are bad? That's loyalty. And I think that's the loyalty that Jesus showed. When bad things happen to us, these are the times when God's asking us, are you really loyal to me? And this is the times we have to answer. Yes, Lord, I am loyal to you. And you can see that through my actions. Thank you for your close attention. And hopefully you can keep Amaziah in your back pocket and be some reminders of the, who the Lord is and the type of hearts that he's looking for us.
We, we've had a lot of people these past couple of weeks that obeyed the gospel, and, and that's very exciting. Uh, something we talked about in the Samuel class, I think Pat, Pat remembers, is that you have a little story of David killing a giant all by himself when nobody else wants to. But then when you end David's story at the end of 2 Samuel, everybody's killed a giant. And they're like, let's sing off like, and, and, and this guy killed a giant, this guy killed a giant, that guy killed a giant too. And we said, well, what changed? Well, usually it, what changed is that one person had the courage to do it, and everybody kind of just rode that track of courage on and, and got it accomplished. And that's how they killed giants. It, it seems to me when people obey the gospel, it sort of happens the same way. You'll go through like a drought, and nobody's obeyed the gospel in a really long time. But then one person, kind of like David and Goliath, has the courage to say, you know what, I'm ready to obey the gospel. I'm going to go obey the gospel. And then what happens at churches when that happens? Well, now everybody's obeyed the gospel. And three people have obeyed the gospel. And four people have obeyed the gospel. And five people have obeyed the gospel. Was it still their decision to do so? Absolutely it was. Just like it was those other men's decision to kill those giants after David did. If there's anyone here that'd like to, to keep this train going, I'd love for someone to obey the gospel again. But as well, if there's someone here that needs the prayers of the congregation, I would consider that to be part of that train as well. That people have the courage to, to come forward and make things right with the Lord. If someone came forward tonight, or if someone comes forward anytime, does that say that there's something wrong with that person and obviously their heart's not right before the Lord? What does it say about a person that's willing to come forward? Maybe even if they don't want to. I think what it actually says is, oh no, here's someone with a loyal heart. Here's someone that really actually cares about God and has every willing intention to be a part of this. And that's why they're asking for the help of the congregation. If there's anyone here that has a loyal heart that needs to do that, why don't you let us assist you if you come forward as we stand and sing?